I, I, you know, I think intermarriage is going to be very healthy. Mm -hmm. And you know, we've been doing this. The Jewish people are intermarrying mm -hmm. forever. This is Faith Complex, a dialogue about the entanglement of religion, politics, and art. Hello, my name is Jacques Berlinerblau of Georgetown University, and you're watching Faith Complex. Joining us today is the esteemed businessman, philanthropist, and author, Edgar Bronfman Sr. Mr. Bronfman is author of Hope, Not Fear, a Path to Jewish Renaissance, which is soon to be re-released in paperback. Mr. Bronfman, welcome to Faith Complex. Thank you. In your book, you made some rather eye-opening arguments about one of the most controversial subjects in American Jewish life. That would be intermarriage. Tell us a little bit about your views on intermarriage. It's not that I advocate intermarriage. It's just, it's here. Mm. And it's not going anywhere. It's like the wind, as Egon Mayer once said. It's just okay. there. Yeah, that's fair enough. And why don't we try to figure out how to use it rather than just keep fighting it? Mm -hmm. Because, of the, you know, you've done that for 20 years. It hasn't worked. Hmm. So let's try something different. So how do you think it can be used effectively for the good of the Jewish community? Well, I think that maybe the Jewish community can start to grow. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, it's just that every time uh, a Jewish guy or a non-Jewish girl or the other way around Go and see a rabbi, ask them to marry them, and the rabbi says, no, you've lost two mm -hmm. Jews. Absolutely. I don't say it's necessary. And I think that we can uh, uh, welcome them with open arms. Mm -hmm. In fact, I've seen, I think, the, the position of Reform Judaism for the last 20 years, at least. Yeah, the position of Reform Judaism to me is the most coherent of all the denominations. I think it actually makes tremendous sense. If you go to a Reform synagogue nowadays and you listen to the names, it's like Gonzalez, McGraw, right? Mm -hmm. Occasional Cohen and Levy, but they're all these names that were never yeah. part of the... But they're there. They're there in the synagogues as Jews. I think, which I think is kind of exciting. Yeah, it actually is exciting. Because otherwise we're going to disappear in America. You know, I think intermarriage is going to be very healthy. Mm-hmm. And you know, we've been doing this, the Jewish people are intermarrying forever. Mm -hmm. They knew about it. Jews being Jews have a tendency to describe themselves as Jews in a variety of different ways, reform, orthodox, conservative, secular, humanistic. Mr. Bronfman, how would you describe yourself as a Jew? Just a proud Jew. Just a proud Jew. Yeah. Nothing more, nothing less. I don't quite like those denominational. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a pick and choose Jew like a lot of other people are. Some things I, I, I do. Uh, because I'm Jewish, uh, and I'm fine with that. When you were uh, a young man, everyone has their favorite part of synagogue and their least favorite part of synagogue. Your favorite part was? Favorite part of synagogue? Of being in synagogue, going to services. Leaving. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And your least favorite part was? Going. Going, okay. <laughs> I think we got it. Very, very good. What about the term cultural Jew? Uh, that does appear in your book. What does that signify to you, to call, to call oneself a cultural Jew? Perhaps it means that you don't believe in God, mm -hmm. but you like the ethics and the culture, the traditions. I think they're very important. Secular humanistic Jews speak a lot about Jewish peoplehood. That that's what's essential to them. That the God question can be bracketed even. Who knows if God exists or who, who cares, right? But it's peoplehood that's important to them. Would yeah. that accurately describe the way you look at yeah. Judaism? Uh -huh. It's your ancestors and your grandchildren and children that are going to come? Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's important that the Jewish people go on. I had a conversation once with Arthur Hertzberg about that. Arthur Hertzberg is probably the best mind mm -hmm. I've met Jewishly. And I said, this is important that we continue. He looked at me and quite surprised and said, Edgar, we've given the world so much. There's so much more to give. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That made sense. <laughs> Was there ever a moment in your life where you didn't feel like being part of the Jewish world or you were estranged from the oh, Jewish yeah. world? Oh, yeah. Most of it. Most of it. When did you... <laughs> Come, return, as, as is often said. Well, I was always Jewish, and I was always very, very aware of the fact that I was Jewish. But it was in my work for the Soviet Jews that I discovered mm -hmm. something, uh, what I'd been missing. Mm. I was uh, standing in front of the uh, Coral Synagogue in Moscow, 
there were these thousands of Jews milling about and talking because there was some chatzara. What year was this? Probably about 19, 1990. And I was amazed that these people would do this. Mm. And I said to myself, you know, after 70 years of no religion, look at these people. They're taking chances. And they're, mm -hmm. you know, I think maybe I've missed something. All right, I'm going to read from Hope Not Fear. Here's a quote I found very interesting. One of the biggest problems in Judaism is the lack of respect among the different denominations. We don't need to agree on everything, but more civility in the Jewish world would be very welcome. Uh, let's talk a little bit about civility in the Jewish world. When did it first strike you that there might be a lack of civility in the inter-Jewish dialogue? I think probably uh, at my father's home when he'd get people to raise money and scream and yell at them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As I got older and came down to New York, Marjo, I realized that the tensions between the Orthodox mm. Uh, and the conservatives, well, that's what's conservative, but the, the reform was yeah. very high. And I didn't like that. I thought that we should, you know, also, you know, discuss it. Discuss it. We don't have to agree. But do you think that sometimes, it strikes me that sometimes the, the ultra orthodox, not the orthodox, the ultra orthodox yeah. are extremely uncivil to the point of discounting other oh, well, Jews. I, as I'm Jews. not even going to talk about the ultra orthodox. We won't even go there, right? Well, mm -hmm. Tommy Lapid. Of, of blessed memory, who was the leader of the anti-religious party in Israel, mm -hmm. said to me when I asked him about peace, he said, when we get our zealots under control, and when they get their zealots under control, we'll have peace. You know. And I consider the other orthodox to be our zealots. All right, so I want to ask you as we wrap up, you work a lot with young uh, Jewish Americans. Uh, what is uh, your greatest joy when you work with uh, younger Jewish Americans. I just find it useful to tell them the truth. So when we talk about the Palestinian or uh, Israeli situations, I always say what I think. And uh, I'm surprised at that and pleased how many that resonates with them. Hmm. And I mean, my sense as a college professor is that a lot of the younger students are a little frustrated with what we might call the traditional way of being pro-Israel. Is that something that you're noticing yourself? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you say to them then? How, what's, the, uh, what's the outlet, what's the resource you send them to, this kind of frustration with the state of Israel? Well, it's easy to be frustrated with the state of Israel. The fact is that you have to put yourself in their shoes mm -hmm. and realize that they're under constant threat of annihilation. Mm -hmm. And that peace is like you get a peace agreement. It's only a piece of paper that can be ripped up and has been done many times throughout the history. So you want to make sure that everybody is secure in the peace that they're going to get right. and that they're guaranteed by uh, the great nations. And uh, if I were Netanyahu right now, mm -hmm. I would sit in a room and say, hey, Abbas, or whoever else, mm -hmm. I'm ready. Let's, let's talk. Right, right. And then when I had a deal, which I could live with, I would not take it to the Knesset and go straight to the country. Mm -hmm. Like a kind of national referendum or yeah, something like that? absolutely. Are you ready to give that good advice to Prime Minister Netanyahu? He's already asked for it. <laughs> We've been speaking to Edgar Bronfman, Sr., author of Hope, Not Fear, The Path to Jewish Renaissance. Mr. Bronfman, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you.